Christy. Hey, Edith. What did the corn farmer say after a good harvest? What? There's polenta more where that came from. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, listeners. Hello, everybody. Hello, gardeners. Hello, wannabe gardeners. Hello, people who like to look at gardening. Yeah, all y'all. And uh, hello, people that just like to listen because they find some funny stuff on here. Let's hope so. And hello, Christy. Hello, Edith. I am excited to talk this week about what we did this summer. Yep. Yeah. You know what's funny? What we did, I know what you did last summer. Isn't that a scary movie? It is a scary movie. And we're doing this right before Halloween. I know what you did last summer. Yeah, but this topic is not scary. This is all the new things that we did this summer and how they turned out. How do you know mine aren't scary? I haven't told you what they were. Oh, that's a very good ah. point. And next week, that means it's our Halloween episode. We're going to have scary stories mm-hmm. and yep. funny, funny, brand new pod plays. Yeah, you guys got to listen. Um, and if nobody sends us scary stories, I don't know what we'll do. It'll be a really short episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have any good Halloween stories, can be scary, can be funny, yeah. can be about gardening, can be off topic, sure. you can send them to us at Upside Down Tulips at Gmail. Um, last year, Edith, we dressed up for the Halloween special. Yep, I have my costume. <gasps> Are you serious? I am. You know, I just oh, like, I, I only do it for you. I oh, never that's so dress awesome. up. awesome. Well, so. last year what we did was we both put them on separately, uh-huh. and then we had our eyes closed, and then we sat down, and we opened our eyes at the same time. Uh-huh. Should we do that again this year? Yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah, well, let's I do had, that again. I think I know what I'm going to do for my costume, so okay, I'll, okay, okay, I'm impressed okay. with that. Really good. I was also going to say, Edith, before we get into a uh, garden update and all that jazz, that last week after the... After we recorded, we, we were having a glass of wine, and we were talking about how, whether or not we were going to cover this week. Yeah. And we, you said, I'm not going to cover. And I said, I'm not going to cover either. We're like, we're done with the garden. Uh-huh. And then, what did you do? I covered. I covered too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I covered three days. Ago. This is the third day they've been covered. This is my, I covered last night. Mm-hmm. And uh, just wasn't, you know, some things I said goodbye to. Well, I brought in all my peppers, you know, stuff like that. I brought everything in. Which is what we talked about last week in the episode Mm -hmm. 62, bring it in and bring it on. Yeah. Yeah. So I brought that in and, uh, but I did a lot of covering. I brought all my geraniums in. Uh, I have my, my rosemary is covered. Okay, gotcha. That's covered because I have not had time to dig it up. So well, next week it's supposed to be highs in the seventies and lows in the forties, and that's why I covered. Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute. Remember last year when when it looked like it was all over in September and it went on for another month. Yeah, who knows? So, who knows? So I covered absolutely. And I also want to mention one other thing, which I thought was interesting for our audience to know. This is that while we were also having our post glass of wine somehow the conversation got around to the game of thrones and i was talking about how you know i think i i might want to start picking up and reading the books and folks you would not believe this but edith goes i happen to have the entire set in my car right now (laughs) (laughs) that's so true i was gonna take them to the used bookstore and sell them or you know you trade for other books you know you treat your used (laughs) books beautifully because they don't even look like they've been open they're oh, so gorgeous that the one that i that one is brand new i gave you the first one i yeah. took out of my box set please treat it with care oh okay yeah i that was one. i was impressed yeah because... the other ones are a little used because yeah okay. anyway i can't wait till you start um you know reading them uh christy do you know what october 21st is what national witch hazel day Oh, isn't that interesting? That is interesting because, you know, Edith, I'm not 
entirely sure I know what exactly witch hazel is. I didn't either. When I saw that, I'm like, what even is witch hazel? So I looked it up. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, so here it is. I bet you other people don't know. I bet you that's not just us. Witch hazel is a deciduous bush or small tree reaching about six meters in height found in the damp woods throughout most of North America. Huh. It is a widely known plant with a lengthy history of use in the Americas. Witch hazel was known to native North American people as a treatment for tumors and eye inflammations along with other things. Hmm. The dried leaves, bark, and twigs are used. You know, they soak them in and make a tincture. That's amazing. Isn't that interesting? I always have witch hazel in my house, and I had no idea what it was, but I've always had it. What always. do you use it for in your house? It's an astringent. So after oh. you wash your face, you oh. know, you it, you just use it as an astringent. That's why you look so beautiful over there. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I have not used the witch hazel in quite some time. But yeah, that's what I thought that was really interesting. Happy National Witch Hazel Day. And what a great name. Witch Hazel. Yeah, and you know, the name Hazel is becoming really popular. It is so again, shout isn't out it? to everybody who's named Hazel out there. Yeah, I'm so glad some of those names are coming back, some of those old, more old-fashioned names. Um, so, so I have to tell you what happened this week. Um, so my neighbor, Lucy, she just had moved here. She's a really nice, beautiful young woman who moved here from San Francisco a year ago. And one day I was out gathering seeds and she came out to introduce herself and she saw what I was doing, but she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm gathering seeds. She goes, why? What? How? What? (laughs) And I said, well, uh, because I, you know, I'll plant them next year. And I told her that we had a podcast, so she became a listener. Then, Hi, Lucy. <laughs> she's so great. A few months later, I gave her some basil cuttings, and she stuck them in water. And, of course, they started to root. And it was like, she would send me pictures, like, once a month, like it was a baby. Of oh. the roots that were growing. Because, you know, it is miraculous, right? Yeah, yeah. So at the beginning of the summer, I gave her a little cherry tomato seedling she kept it she she grew it to to fruition had it in a container and then she took a couple of cherry tomatoes she took a flower pot with potting soil in it and she squeezed the cherry tomatoes the inside of them onto the soil kind of raked the dirt over Mm -hmm. the soil over it thank you soil you're welcome i saw your eyes (laughs) raked the soil over it and she did this three weeks ago. Christy, they're all up. Oh, my goodness. So you know how we had that seed episode and how you take the seeds out and dry them and leave them on the counter? Yeah. Well, apparently, for some things, you don't have to do anything like that. As you have always said, things want to grow. They want to live. So I said to her, so do you have a grow light? She goes, no. I said, are you going to thin them? She goes, I don't know what that is. <laughs> So we're going to have a little meeting. Oh, good. This weekend, because maybe she can bring some of them. I mean, it's you know, who knows? Who knows? She's going to need a, a pretty serious grow light. She's going to need a serious grow light. But I just thought that was so cool. That's you amazing. Know, I just thought that was really cool. Yay, Lucy. Welcome to the gardening world. Yes. Hey, we have a shout out to a new <laughs> garden party member, Edith. Um, Who would that be? This is a thank you to Claire from Washington, D.C., Claire is a member of the garden party, and that means she throws us a couple bucks a month to help support the podcast. Did you know that they did a survey and that Washington, D.C. has the smallest backyards on average in the country? Oh. So shout out to all the gardeners who are doing probably container gardening in the middle of that busy, busy city. How cool is that? And if you folks want to become a supporter, a patron of Upside Down Tulips, you just need to click on the link in the show notes or go to our website. It's UpsideDownTulips.com. Very nice, Edith. (laughs) Good. Good. We also have things, you know, other places. (laughs) (laughs) You were doing so well. You should have stopped while you were ahead, Edith. Well, you had to, yeah. Okay, how's how's your garden been doing, Christy? Very good. Um, I think the first thing I need to tell everybody is last week I challenged myself because of my forsythia plant. And la- ah. and I bought a forsythia plant in April-ish. Mm-hmm. I got it on sale. I've always wanted one because they're the 
first flower in the spring. That's bright yellow. Beautiful yellow. They're like little flowers of joy after a long winter. And as of last week, I embarrassingly said that I had not planted it yet. And I think I figured out why I hadn't planted it, Edith. Why? Because I have a fear of putting things in the wrong place. Now, if it's an annual or perennial, it doesn't really matter that much because you can move it. But if it's a tree or a bush or a Uh shrub, I have made mistakes like that where I've just kind of gone, boy, if I just moved it three feet. Yep. So I think that's why it sat there. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Well, where'd you put it? I did plant it. You did plant it. I did plant it. Yes, I did. (laughs) And I want to say, I made, I I dug a million dollar hole. Good, because it deserves it now. It has been waiting and waiting. We say, folks, you should always dig a $50 hole for a 50-cent plant. It's really more about the hole. Yeah. And I got down in there, and I and I dug, 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 you know, where I'm just getting, like, roots of other things, and I'm pulling them out, I'm getting in there. So I dug it, I planted it, um, and, and then you, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and you watered it really well. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, good. I probably should go out tomorrow again and water it again. Well, yeah, it might even snow tonight. It was snowing, you know, like right up in uh, Evergreen. Oh, and that stuff. poor, oh, that poor first they plant. The roots were so root bound. I had to really scarify the oh. the ball to make sure I teased all the roots out. Yeah, you can do that, folks. Don't leave it in a ball. You can pull them, pull out. it out. Roughed, I roughed it up a bit, kind of scarified it. Yeah, yeah, good. So that's so. Th- anyway, that's in. And um, you know, last week, Edith, you asked about broccolini. Yeah. Do you remember Did that? you find out? I did find out because, folks, um, Edith and I both have been keeping broccoli all year long because mm-hmm. once you cut off the main stalk, you can get little baby heads. And somebody in Edith's garden said, oh, is that broccolini? Because it looks a little bit like broccolini because there's lots of little baby heads mm-hmm. on it. It is not broccolini. Uh-huh. Technically, broccolini is a crossbreed of broccoli and Chinese broccoli, which is a leafy vegetable. And the amazing thing about broccolini is that the stems are thin and tender, so you don't have to worry about overcooking the, f- the flower part, oh. you know, the floret part, and waiting for the bottom parts to cook. Oh, so, isn't that interesting? So that's what we have. Okay. And how about you, Edith? How's your garden going? Well, you know what? I go out there the other day, and I had, ha- I had like eight beautiful spaghetti squash. Only two were ripe, and I went out the other day. And they were both opened up and half eaten, and I caught the squirrel in the act. Are so, you sure, Edith, that was a squirrel? You mean it could have been maybe a beaver? It probably <laughs> could have been a beaver, Edith. It could have been. I've seen them around here. Listen to me. <laughs> She's a smart ass. You listen to me. I marched over to my neighbors, and I go, I saw the squirrel. I don't think it was a beaver slash raccoon. <laughs> So because, because the dang squirrels ate my two ripe ones, I brought them all in. Yeah. So now what I've been doing is, until it got really cold, I've been take them out to the porch to put them in the sun because they will ripen off vine. It just takes a lot longer. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing. But better to have that than to have... No spaghetti no, squash. Yeah. Yeah. When I remember last year when that's all we had was spaghetti squash. We had so many spaghetti squash. Wow. And now this year, I don't have any. I didn't grow any spaghetti squash because I, I thought my volunteer squash uh-huh. was a spaghetti squash. It turned out to be pumpkin. Well, I promised you one, and that's another reason I'm trying to save their lives. Oh, uh, You know, thanks. so I have some for people. Um, Did you, Is your zucchini done? Uh, pretty much. It's really paused. It paused a while back, and mm. I I picked a six inch one yesterday, mm. and I have a feeling that's that's probably going to be it, because they don't like the cold either. Well, you know that zucchini I planted in July. Yeah, <laughs> as I'm covering things up. Yesterday, my handsome and handy husband is helping me, and he goes, Christy. You're not getting any zucchini <laughs> this year. <laughs> uh, but you had a lot of yellow squash, right? Yes, I yes, did. did. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, plenty. Well, folks, please check out our website for the funny and informative Upside Down Dictionary at UpsideDownTulips.com or click on the link in our show notes. And also, you should check out the fun stuff we have on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. 
And now we have a repeat of a pop play we did last year about football because that's our second hobby. We love football and we love gardening. It's back by popular demand, Christy. And then following that, later on in the episode, stay tuned for a brand new pot play. Yes. Called Boxing Tomatoes. It's also about sports. You know, we're in the theater and a lot of theater people, they just, they don't go to sports. They just call it sports ball. <laughs> Everything is sports ball. This is not funny. <laughs> Are you a gardener who is also a football fan, who times your Sunday garden chores in order to watch your favorite games? But what happens if you have to choose? Garden or football? Why not have both? Christy and Edith, the ladies of Upside Down Tulips, understand your pain. We can help you envision football in your own backyard while you are doing your chores with you as quarterback. Here we are on a brisk September day. I'm Christy, and this is Edith, and we'll be announcing the garden game today. And the gardener comes onto the field. It's chaos out there, folks. The neighbors are going wild. The dandelions are throwing seeds into the radishes. The zucchini is in spread offense and running out of bounds. The tomatoes are tired and bent over with their own weight. And the bindweed is in the slot. The gardener is on the field holding his hoe close. It looks like he's going after the bindweed. He uses his hoe to do a chop block, and he is chopping up the bindweed. Oh, that's going to cost him. That's a penalty, but the refs do nothing, and the crowd is out of control. And the bindweed has him in a tackle. The gardener looks left, looks right. He sees the acorn squash, and the squash is totally open. We've got the squirrels on offense to thank for that. The gardener breaks free of the bindweed. He goes for the acorn. He's got the squash. Looks like he's going for a Hail Mary. No. He's running a post pattern, running free from the back 40. And he's on the 35, the 30, the 20. He might go all the way. He's taking it to the house. Touchdown. He's definitely getting the MVG of this game, Edith. And no one deserves the most valuable gardener more. Go. Insert your team name here. Go Broncos. And go Vikings. <laughs> and go Vikings. Hey, Edith. Yes, Christy. I know what you did last summer. Do tell you know what I did yeah, last summer? No, I don't. You tell me. Okay. So, friends, we're going to tell you some of the new things we did last summer and how they turned out. Mm-hmm. First of all, the new thing I did this year was that I did not grow any heirloom tomatoes. I only grew hybrid tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think um, hybrid tomatoes get a bad rap. Um, a hybrid tomato is nothing more than the offspring of two different parent plants, sort of like dog breeding. And they're just artificially pollinated by a gardener. It's a combination of two plants. He does it with like, sometimes they do it with like a little Q-tip. <laughs> just clarifying. Okay, good. Thank do they you. really? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Well, usually these plants are crossbred to produce a new variety that often will have specific traits that um, could be um, early maturation, uniformity, color, disease resistance. Um, the first hybrid tomato was Burpee's Big Boy in 1949. And it provided great disease resistance and got, and it's predictable. Mm -hmm. The reason why I did this was because I have, my soil has been susceptible to diseases and blight. And it's probably, it's an, a lot of soil. It's, yeah. it's very, it's very common. Yeah. No blame, Christy. No blame oh, at all. Oh, thank gardeners. you so much. Yeah. Um, now the downside of growing hybrid tomatoes is that, um, you can't save seeds from them. Right, because so it won't grow true. won't grow true. Mm -hmm. So they'll only exist for one generation. And there's no s real story behind a hybrid tomato like there can be a around heirloom tomatoes. Um, and we always say you should try grow, grow both. Yes. Grow, grow a little combination of heirloom and hybrid. Well, which I did because you gave me, you gave me some hybrid. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any. I forgot mm -hmm. about them again. And you gave me some celebrities, so they came in two to three weeks earlier than mm. my heirloom, so it was a really good idea to plant both. It's not bad to have hybrid because, you know, the food that you are growing is certainly better than the food that you're going to buy in the store. There is nothing yeah. wrong with a hybrid. It's not like a GMO. Yeah. It's really not. Exactly. 
So my, my soil is prone to wilt and, and rotating is not working. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm going to, for three years, I'm going to just grow hybrids. And I'll tell you what, it worked fantastic. Well, I'm so glad because, Christy, not everybody has a garden big enough where you can actually rotate effectively. Oh, that's a good point. You know, think about those people in Washington, D.C., smallest garden. Yes, I mean, right. They don't. Nothing wrong with so. And I made sure that the plants that I bought had the following um, code on them. That's mm-hmm. kind of the tomato code, mm-hmm. which is V, which means it's good against verticillium wilt. Oh, it doesn't mean it's very good? Yes, right. So good. Good. I'm glad we're clarifying this, good. Edith. Good. F. Which means it's good. Friggin' ag- good. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. It means it's good against ver- uh, uh, fusarium and an, which means it's good against the bad nematodes. So I grew a 4th of July, an early girl, a big boy, a super sweet, a those super are, steak. Mm, those are all great. Kind of classic hybrids. Those are and great. I, the tomatoes keep coming in. They will not stop. Yeah. And... I know this is that when we are when we are no longer covering Edith, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be bringing tomatoes in. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have boxes to put up in the attic again. Yeah. yeah, everybody, you can really save tomatoes for a long, long time in boxes. Okay, well, what about um, you, Edith? What did you do last summer? What I did that I've never done before: I bought two bags of onions, a red and a, a yellow. And you know, it comes with a hundred bulbs. Oh my goodness! They always come with a hundred bulbs. Well. Who can eat that many onions usually? <laughs> and if they all come in at the same time, you're inundated. You can only eat so much onion soup. You're in onion-dated. Oh, God, you're inundated. Oh, my God. You're inundated. Well, thank you, Christy. <laughs> so what I did this year, I planted a huge beginning crop because you can plant them fairly early. Mm-hmm. And I ate them at every single stage of development. So that in the beginning, it was like eating a, what is it when the, the little onions ate? Like a little chive or a little scallion. A scallion. It was okay. like eating scallions. And every single time, Christy, that I ate one, I replanted immediately another bulb. Every single time. So I still have onions that I have not completely eaten. You were all diligent. Of the onions. Yeah, you have to be diligent, but I really think it was worth it. You know, I've never grown onions. I've grown scallions. It is so fun to grow onions chives. because they're guaranteed because they come in a bulb. Well, I have to tell you this is that um, one of our listeners, Holly, she gave me some walking onions. Have you heard of those before? No. So I, I'll, maybe I'll look some up and we'll talk about it next week. But okay. she gave me some walking onions and, I, and she wants you to have some too. Oh, that sounds so cool. Thank you, Holly. That sounds wonderful. Well, another new thing I did this year was that I planted African marigolds. And folks, what these are also called American marigolds or Aztec marigolds, and they are an annual, so they only happen for once a year and then they're done, and they bloom from early summer until frost. And what's great about these marigolds is that they're a lot taller than the French style. They are more tolerant of hot and dry conditions than the French marigold, and they have larger flowers. And if you deadhead them regularly, which means removing the spent blooms, Mm -hmm. you can produce blossoms all summer long. Um, And they also don't mind poor soil. You know, may I just say, because I plant French marigolds, except for the height, the French marigolds are the same thing. They're the easiest. They don't, you don't really hardly ever have to water and they're fantastic. They're fa- the French marigolds are great, but the African marigolds um, are more tolerant of hot and dry conditions okay. than the French marigold. And um, I grew them because I wanted something to cover up my iris more in the beds that I have alongside my house. Right. I also, it's kind of fun to try new things. It's great to try new things. And I'll tell you this, is that they are four to five feet tall, all full of blooms, big, huge pom-poms. And um, I winter sowed these friends, oh, which wow. means that I sowed these probably in around March ish, yeah, outside in my milk jugs, and um, so they're very they germinated very easy. This way, I could put them exactly where I wanted them to be. Yeah, did you plant any direct sow? 
Did you put any seeds straight into the ground? No, I winter sowed all of them because the seed wow. packet that I had didn't have that many seeds in it. Oh. So I thought, I'll just try this. But now I'm going to have a lot oh, of seeds. Oh, they, they give you, you know. I'm really excited about these. Population uh, explosion African seeds. marigold. So that's Beautiful. one of the new things I did. Well, this year, um, I finally planted a fall crop of radishes that didn't get burnt up by the sun. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, really glad about that. I think one of the reasons is I planted them kind of like north of the peach tree. Uh-huh. So it got shade in some parts of the day because it's still very hot here. We had a really hot September. I think a lot of the country did. Yeah. But anyway, so I am enjoying radishes. Can I ask you a question, Edith? Because I also planted a second. Is it a personal? Because I don't like personal questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to know. I'm trying to think. I'm just, okay. I don't know. I do not know. Is it know. about a radish? It is about radishes. Okay. I think you can ask me pretty safely. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Go ahead. So I also planted a second crop of radishes. Yeah. And I harvested some and they're beautiful because you know, I love the French yes, kind love that the are long, longer long ones. ones. Yeah. And do you ever notice when you pull out a radish, Yeah. if you don't do anything with it right away? It gets all, it dries up so quickly. It, get, it gets rubbery? Yeah. Uh, do you cut the top off? I don't know. Maybe I don't. Oh, is that what I need to do is to yeah. cut the top? Oh. Yeah. Because the plant is still whole and expecting water because the root is oh, on good. and the greens are on. Okay. So I usually cut the top off. Okay. So I'm just trying to live by the brand and learn from my gardening mistakes, Edith. <laughs> Me too, Christy. <laughs> Me too. Let's go listen to some boxing tomatoes. Oh, yay. Here we are ringside in Madison Square Garden, New York, New York, for the boxing event of the decade. The match between two tomatoes to determine who is the world heavyweight tomato champ. In this corner of the ring, we have the current world champ, weighing in at 8.39 pounds, the big Zack Tomato. He has fought and beaten the big boy, the better boy, and the beefsteak. Is bigger better, Betty? By God, Bobby, you better believe it. Big Zack's challenger in the other corner is a Titan tomato grown from the seed of the Guinness World Record holder for the heaviest tomato ever, grown by Dan McCoy of Ely, Minnesota. And weighing in at 8.2 pounds, it's Titan the Third. And they're off. They're rolling around in the ring, and Titan connects with a combination of a jab, right cross, and left hook to the stem. Oh, that's gotta hurt. Now Big Zack comes back with a jab, a cross, a left uppercut, and a punch to the navel. But that's below the belt. No, Bobby, there are no belts on boxing tomatoes. Oh, Look at Titan, he's as badly shaken as a bottle of clotted ketchup. Now Titan has Big Zack in the corner, and this is getting ugly. There's tomato juice and seeds flying everywhere. And before we have nothing but tomato soup up there, the ref has called it a draw. Thoughts, Bobby? Well, Betty, I'm a gardener, and I know that good things can come in small packages. So you don't have to grow the biggest, just as long as you grow something. You're a winner in the ring of life. Christy, I was trying to bring a little Howard Cosell into that. Did you recognize that? Very good. Howard Cosell. Yes. (laughs) No one over the age of 40 is... Everyone, everyone over the age of 40 knows who that is, and no one under the age of 40 knows who we're talking about. You know what? Maybe we should put him in our upside-down dictionary. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Let's do you it. Know, that's funny. Okay, oh, that's funny. I love do it. it. Very good. Okay, well, back to our topic. What else did you do last summer, Christy? I planted a perennial called Maximilian Sunflower, uh-huh. and that was new. This is a perennial sunflower, folks. So usually sunflowers are annuals or seeds that the plant will grow and then it'll die in the frost and it won't come back the next year. You have to keep replanting. This is a perennial. It, it's from a tuber. It's a native prairie perennial and it is beautiful. I got this from a trade that I did. So I offered up a bunch of plants on a Facebook 
a group page called uh, Wheat Ridge Gardeners and just offered up plants. And Cece from Wheat Ridge said, I would love some of your plants. I have nothing to trade. Oh, wait, I do. I have some Maximilian sunflowers. And I, and I had n- never even heard of it. These plants are beautiful. They are tall, full of flowers. They bloom in September. Wow. Isn't that nice to have something blooming in September? so nice. They have very low water usage, full sun, but get this, Edith, the soil moisture, dry, moist, it doesn't care. Wow. It prefers clay-like soil. Wow. But it's also tolerant of a wide variety of soils. Um, Mine were like six feet tall. Of course... I put them in the wrong place. Oh. However, that's an easy fix because I think I can just dig it up next yes. year and put a place. Plus, it'll make seeds, right? Oh, my gosh. Right. Oh, no. What? What? Oh. <laughs> I didn't think about that part. Okay. Oh, before you go on, yes, because I planted sunflowers once, just regular old sunflowers. Uh-huh. They reseed themselves oh, most sure. Like crazy. I yeah. literally have to get rid of them in the spring. I would have too. I would have nothing but sunflowers. I call it the great sunflower purge every year because I have to pull so many up. You have to. Or that's all you'd have. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, next year I will dig up these tubers and move this to a better place. But it sure was nice to have something bright and sunny in the end of August, early September. Yeah. It's, you know, I saw it. It's very, very beautiful. Okay. So, um... I have a an, a failure. I call this a failure because I didn't have one single decent spinach this year. Not one. Uh. I planted um, the Viraflay, which kicked butt last summer. Nothing. I planted New Zealand spinach, which even I told everybody about because it tolerates the heat. But it was kind of puny and putrid. I didn't gardening, like it. Gardening is weird. It is weird. <laughs> so I didn't have any spinach at all. Darn it. Oh, one thing I did new this year was that I planted a new kind of pepper. Mm-hmm. Though technically I didn't plant it. My our friend Melanie down the street grew this pepper from seed. It's called a bikino. Bikinto? Bikino. Oh, no T. Okay. No T, uh, but with a silent H. Oh. How about that? And this is a very small, tear-shaped pepper. And the skin ripens from pale green to bright red. So the plant is really pretty as it's it's, uh, turning color. Um, They have a mild heat. They range from 500 to 1,000 on the Scoville scale. Mm -hmm. Not to be confused with the Paul Schofield scale. Mm Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty mild in the scheme of things because like your regular bell pepper ranks like zero yeah. and then a jalapeno pepper is like 10,000, right? Have you tasted one of them? Uh, not yet, no. I can't wait till you do. Okay, well, wait. we should have another pepper tasting. Let's have a pepper tasting. Okay, okay. very, very good. Um, they're supposed to taste, um, have a little bit of heat but taste mostly fruity. Oh. And mostly they're, gro- they're grown for their ornamental nature because they're just so pretty. Yeah, they are pretty. And, um, it's native to Brazil. Um, I had it in a pot on my patio all summer long. And, of course, I brought the whole pot in, as we talked about last week, on uh, how to bring in some of your favorite mm-hmm. plants. And so I'm going to have to harvest the whole plant and uh, put it in a cool place and not panic when the leaves fall off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember you telling, okay. telling that. that. Yeah, good, good. So you know, even, you know what? There's kind of a redemption story here, if you can have that and apply it to spinach. Um, I planted, and it was on the advice of one of our listeners who wrote us a letter. I think it might have been Lula. Uh Uh-huh. I planted Swiss chard, which to me was the biggest success, biggest surprise of my garden. Christy, I had, I figured this out, I had eight months of fresh greens in zone 5B where we are. Because of, and it was almost accidental. So I started with corn salad, which you start to see in February, and it, you can harvest it in April. It's tiny, but it's really, really good. Then there were the 100 volunteers of the four se- Marvel of the Four Seasons lettuce. When that was gone, the Swiss chard was ready. 
and it is fantastic. And then it was the arugula, which I planted because you had some. So uh, arugula is good outside down to 22 degrees. Oh, my goodness. Swiss chard is good down to 15. So why did I cover my arugula two days ago? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I don't know. But that's what it said. It's the <laughs> Wow, that's good. Eight months of fresh greens. That's just amazing. That's incredible. And you can steam the Swiss chart. It's just like, I really feel like I discovered something. And it was through a letter that somebody wrote us here to Upside Down Tulips. That's great. Yeah. The new thing I tried this year was soil pep, which Ah. we've talked about on the podcast before. This is something that Edith uh, turned me on to. Um, I think the first time I heard about it was in episode two when we were just doing the first two commandments, water and mulch, Uh and you mentioned soil pep. And then we talk about it more in episode 51, which is what we learned from each other. As a reminder to folks that this is a type of bark mulch, but it is three-eighths minus screened bark material, so it's fine. Yeah. And it provides organic nutrients to improve the soil structure, It's used as a main ingredient in container mixes, in greenhouse mixes, in potting soils, um, or any other type of general soil preparation. And I used it as a bark mulch or top dressing for my whole vegetable garden this year. And when I planted my forsythia bush, I also used a a good four inches of that. In fact, I should go put some more out there on top of it. And how much did I spend on it? I bought two bags at five dollars a piece, ten bucks. That covered my whole fourteen by forty vegetable garden. That's folks. fantastic because not only, not only does it um, protect, it decomposes fairly quickly. Like the big cedar bark takes a few years. Uh huh. This stuff decomposes and goes right into the soil and amends the soil. At the end of the season, basically. Mm-hmm. And it's it looks fam- really nice, too. It's really... It doesn't look fake, like some of that yeah. red cedar chips. Yeah, it looks real. It looks really nice. Yeah. It makes your yard look really clean. Well, Christy, the last thing I did, I want to talk about my moon garden. Oh, good. I was going to say, if you were going to mention the moon garden. The moon Ada. garden, which is a way, of, a method of gardening where you garden by the moon, where you plant things that grow up when the moon is getting bigger. So corn, peppers, tomatoes, stuff like that. And we're talking about planting by seed, okay? And then when the moon is waning, getting smaller, you plant things that go down, like root vegetables. And you know what? I think it worked. It, I had a beautiful moon garden. And I planted it also like the Three Sisters, which is the Native American corn, tomatoes, and squash. So the squash grew... Corn, uh, beans, and squash. I'm sorry, corns, oh. beans, yeah. and squash. That's right, that's right. I have tomatoes in there too, but... So the beans didn't work out well, but my fault. I planted too close to the wall, not enough sun. Mm. The squash grew along the fence, fantastic. Used the sunflowers for a lattice. Oh, I love that. So they were just everywhere. And the corn was fantastic. It's a small garden. I had 10 stalks of corn but you know it's pretty i didn't realize how pretty the corn would be i used to grow corn all the time just for that reason because it's pretty it's just so pretty yeah yeah now edith you also cut your hair by the moon too don't you yes because um if you want to have less haircuts then when the moon is getting way when it's smaller getting smaller get it cut then and your hair will be short longer Oh, that's an awkward sentence. It'll be short for a longer period of time. My neighbor, Victoria, who is from Colombia, told me that in the rural areas of Colombia, everybody plants by the moon and gets their hair cut by the moon. So not only do you get gardening advice, but you also get fashion tips and beauty advice. Fashion tips and money-saving tips, all kinds of tips. So many tips. (laughs) You could think we'd be a circumcisers. (laughs) Christy, Edith, I'm not wearing a watch, but I think I know what time it is. <laughs> what time is it, Edith? It's mailbag time, Christy. Ring, ring. <laughs> what is it this week? This week, Edith, we have a letter from my little sister, Lori. Hey, Lori. In Chicagoland. Nice. 
I have to read the subject line to this because it's so funny. Okay. The good, the bad, and the holy yikers Batman. That thing is ugly. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I like the tone, and I felt you were a little bit cheeky. Oh, okay. I, I need to, I should need to go rehearse some more. She writes, Hi, Christy and Edith. I want to share with y'all how my first ever cherry tomato and basil garden turned out. I'm usually more of a flower gardener, but wanted to branch out a bit this year. And that's how we're sure she's your sister. <laughs> Love okay. those puns. The good. I picked an awesome spot to plant with loads of sunshine, creating a bountiful harvest of sweet, yummy cherry tomatoes. With them, I made loads of tomato basil pasta sauce, some which I froze for down the road, which is smart, uh, uh, a few jars of some yummy barbecue chicken glaze. I would not have thought of that. That's clever. Yeah, Lori, I want that recipe. And leaving plenty for salads and around the house snacking. Even family and friends and neighbors weren't left out. They got to enjoy their share, too. Oh, that's always the best part. Almost the best part. Good. Yeah. Who wants to turn down a homegrown tomato? Nobody. They yeah. love it. She keeps going. The bad. Overcrowding. Ignorant of just how large tomato plants can actually grow, I purchased tomato cages, which quickly proved to be too short, grouped a couple plants together in one cage, and failed to accurately allocate enough spacing in between each tomato cage. I still do that. Yeah, it's it's almost impossible to tell in the yeah. spring. It really is. Or I put the 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 small tomato in the big cage, and yeah. then the big tomato goes in the small cage. It's like yeah. they do it on purpose. Yeah. The mammoth bushes soon intertwined with each other, making for some difficulty in picking the tomatoes. I ended up pruning a good amount of it periodic, periodically to keep from feeling overwhelmed, Losing some of the tomatoes in the process. No, that was smart, Lori. That was a good oh, thing smart. to do. I can't prune. I need to learn how. I love to prune. In addition, I planted the basil too close to the tomato plants where eventually they received too much water and not enough sunlight would shorten their lifespan. Boo. Boo. Pre-Halloween. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> Although I know my garden forgives me, I have learned for next time to give my plants more space to grow and flourish. Mm-hmm. Good lesson. And now for the ugly. I was fairly okay with the run-of-the-mill insect world hanging out with me while harvesting. It's their jurisdiction, after all. Nothing, however, prepared me for what I discovered eating my tomato leaves. A fat, long, green caterpillar-like creature carrying gross white things on its back. Yikes and yuck. I found out later it's called a hornworm. Some experts say the white things are wasp larvae. Others say they're wasp cocoons. Maybe you can get to the bottom of the debate and report back to us. Anyway, that's my story. Thanks for listening, and thanks for all the great gardening tips and tricks. Keep up the good work, Lori. That's a really nice letter, and I, who love gross things, apparently, have looked into some of this wasp larvae stuff. It is, they are wasp, wasp larvae. You could also call them cocoons, because they're not moving yet. They're growing. When they come out of there, they will eat the hornworm. They go inside. They eat it from the inside they go out, right? And they eat it, yeah. And they while eat it's it alive. While it's alive. There's a fly that does that to crickets, too. It's dangerous being an insect, my friends. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? The first time I ever saw a tomato hornworm, they are just creepy looking. Oh, they are actually, you actually want to scream. Yeah. Remember I had one on my, on my Bokashi bucket this year. I haven't seen one in a long time, but I saw it on the bucket. Yes, I did. Well, Lori, thank you so much for writing this wonderful letter. And folks, if you want to tell us what are the things that you did last summer, how did they work, what didn't work, if you have questions for us, mm -hmm. funny stories, yes. we'll take it all. Yes. I don't know why you wouldn't do that, folks. We ask you every single week. Just write to us at upside down tulips at gmail or... UpsideOutTulips.com because we can't do everything, folks. <laughs> we need participation here. <laughs> I smell incense and hear beautiful piano music coming in. It must be time for inspiration. 
It is, and it's my turn, and here we go. This quote is from Alfred Austin, and he says, There is no gardening without humility. Nature is constantly sending even its oldest scholars to the bottom of the class for some egregious blunder. <laughs> Alfred Austin. That's great. Isn't that good? I love that because it's so egalitarian, too. Yeah. It's not like you can ever you ever stop learning. You mm-hmm. never stop learning in the garden. Yeah, and it so, does make you humble. Yes, it does. And uh, your humble hosts are thanking you now for listening. Thank you so much. We are... Christy Montour Larson and Edith Weiss. And if you got some laughs and other good things out of this week's episode, you could do something for us. You know what you could do? You could press the subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much to Denise Gentilini. Folks, she's a genius. You'll see next week. You'll see what a genius she is. She's got new Halloween music for us. It's so good. Thank you for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you want to hear more of her music, go to denisegentilini.com or find that link where? At our website, of course, upsidedowntulips.com. And thank you to our kind friend and very talented actor, John Ashton. Thank you to our excellent yet elusive engineer. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. And we mean that, folks. He's a real friend of the show. He's like a sponsor and his his, it's amazing. His greenhouse is amazing. Mm-hmm. Join us next week for our Halloween special. We have Halloween stories and new spooky pod plays. And don't forget, if you make a mistake, your guard will forgive you. Always. <laughs>